Okay, I bet almost everybody did. Um, so as you know, I'm going to be talking about generic programming in Haskell. Um, I will go through the slides just as a as, as it seems as it works. But if you want to ask questions anytime, please do. Um, like I said earlier, interactivity is nice. And questions are nice and. If the, if, yeah, just tell me to slow down, speed up, or whatever. Um, so, I am doing my PhD at Utrecht University in, um, in a group that is very strong in functional programming, especially in Haskell. Um, my research has involved generic programming as well as uh, program transformation um, and type systems. Um, and I've also taught generic programming some other courses. Um, so you can also ask me about any of that stuff. So first of all, just to widen the circle of what we're talking about, what is generic programming? You all probably have different definitions depending on what background you come from. Generic is a generic word. It's uh, heavily overloaded. You know Java, C Sharp, generics, uh, you all have probably programmed in that. You may have seen C++ templates, um, another form of generics. And um, ADA, which I don't know if anybody's used ADA. Mm -hmm. They have their own generics, which is also yet another meaning. Um, so what is it? Well, the goal of generics and all these images is usually it's the same. Usually it involves some sort of higher abstraction than you can get in the normal language without generics. Usually generics means it's sort of an extension to a language. And the technique of generics in a language, the way the feature works, is also often the same. Usually there's a parameter and then you instantiate that, that parameterized thing with something and you get something. So examples, Java, C Sharp, you have a type parameter, okay, you have this class that implements a stack for arbitrary objects, but you don't want to say before they had generics in Java, it only was a stack for object because object was the superclass of everything. You want it to be a, more, a bit more well typed. C++ templates, um, you have here you have two type parameters um, and a function that computes the minimum of two things that are both of the same type T and a function comp that is, has some type compare that takes those two things and gives you uh, and tells you if, how they compare if one is less than the other. Um, so you can see that this is already a bit more complicated than um, the Java style generics. So another way of putting this in context with Haskell is that, and, and other languages, is that Java style, Java C sharp style of generics is typically called parametric polymorphism. Polymorphism. It's a approximate description, and C plus plus templates approximate some ad hoc polymorphism. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with these words, but uh, so parametric polymorphism, you can like have a stack over some type, but you can't look at that type. And ad hoc is to say we have multiple different um, instances for different types, but those instances can differ depending on what that type is. So in the C-sharp or C++ example, uh, we can have different implementations of the compare. And in Java, we don't have that. Um, in Haskell, both of these forms of polymorphism already exist. They're there from nearly the beginning of the language, if you will. We don't call them generics because they are sort of native language. They don't, uh, they are inherent in the features of the foundations of lambda calculus and ML. And, um, 
in, in, in Haskell, we have uh, so parametric polymorphism, we just have polymorphism, we call it. And uh, type classes are our implementation of ad hoc polymorphism. Um, what we call generics in the Haskell world, we, I mean, generally the Haskell community and the people who came up with this stuff um, in the last 15 years or so, uh, is called data type generic program. Um, the idea is that we abstract over the structure of a data type. And we'll talk about what the structure of the data type is. There are other names for it that have gone through the years. Uh, polytypism, poly being many, so multiple types. Uh, shape, structure, polymorphism, another way of saying polymorphism. So to talk about data types in our program, we have to start with data types. So let's do a, a bit of a, a refresher on what data types are in this in the context of the structure. So here I've got um, an example data type D, data type declaration for data type D. It takes uh, parameter P and has two different constructors. I call them alt for alternative, alt1, alt2. Alt2 takes two fields, two, two arguments, int and the type P, the uh, same parameter. So a data type can have some number of parameters, zero or more. These parameters are hypervariants. These are, um, this is sort of how you know, parametric polymorphism is, is implemented in it for a data type. A data type can have alternatives, multiple constructors. Each constructor is unique, a uniquely named um, value. And you can, you can have zero or more. The uh, interesting note, so there are different standardizations of Haskell. Uh, Haskell 98 is the one most people know of. There's recently a uh, sort of standardized Haskell 2010, which allowed you, which, which added the ability to have zero uh, constructors. Uh, okay. You don't always think of that as a feature. How do you, what, what does that mean then? How do you so, construct a type? Of, what is a type with zero constructors? So this would be the declaration. And okay. it would just be data D parameters. Um, and what's the point? Um, I don't have any examples uh, today, but uh, you know the value undefined in Haskell. Undefined is bottom. also called bottom. Yeah. So every uh, type has this as a value. So the value of, of a, a um, data type with no constructors, um, which sometimes they call phantom types, uh, is the only thing can be as bottom. But um, you can always use it in, um, in a type signature. So you could say I have a, I could say I have a function that returns different types of D parameterized by P, and I can just throw in uh, one of these other types there, even though the type value may be bottom. And this can give you a bit more um, type safety because now you can distinguish the different uh, um, things that are parameterized by this D. It's a bit fuzzy. Uh, it also is helpful with, it's also useful with uh, um, generalized algebraic data types, GATs. Mm -hmm. The point is that you don't, it's, it's, it is an extra feature because you can always declare a data type with one constructor and then not use that constructor. Uh, but if you don't use it, then yeah, this is a, a nice little extra thing. So alternatives or constructors can have fields, uh, also called arguments to the constructor. Uh, they're declared with types, uh, as, I, as I get here, int and p. And these can be zero or more, so I have one with zero and one with two. Um, some other non-syntactic features, so I'll just mention the syntactic features, the ones that are, you can see from the syntax. Recursion, I could have had one of these fields also be a D. Um, and nesting, and nesting is putting uh, another uh, data type in a field. So if I had all three with uh, a maybe int, I'm nesting maybe in that. Um, these won't really come to play for the during this talk, but 
when you get into real interesting generic programming stuff, then nesting is an issue because you have, first we look at the structure of this data type, then you have to look at the structure of the nested data type. So, um, and there are other features, as I mentioned, GADTs, um, many others, but we'll stick with these as a, as a basic foundation. So, first let's talk about the alternatives that I mentioned. So here's another example data type. A1, A2, each one has a single field, single uh, type for a field. Notice that this is quite similar to the either type. The either is a standard um, Haskell is in the prelude, and it says we have a left or a right alternative, and these have two different uh, types, uh, which are uh, declared in the parameters. So we can, in fact, say that this alt x2 can be modeled as either in char. So we sort of align the constructors and the types. The types um, become the parameters to, or the arguments to either. And now we have a type synonym. So these two are data types. This is a type synonym. The data type gives us structure. It's something we can pattern match on. A type synonym um, is not. A type synonym merely says that this name is equal to this. So when we want to pattern match on this or use this, we always have to use the constructors of this type. Um, we add these smart constructors uh, so that we can easily um, build types of alt x2 prime. So now instead of using these, these constructors here, we would use these. Now pattern matching, we still have to pattern match on left or right. Um, no big deal. So you can see there's a correlation between these two. The, uh, in the structural sense, we typically call these sums. Um, the either is a binary sum type. Just to, to, to reduce the size of the code and sort of just distinguish this from every any other either, uh, we'll use the special type, which is exactly identical to either. Uh, we just call it plus or the L and R. So what about data types with more than two alternatives? Well, we get the binary sum, but this is triangle. Um, no problem. We just nest them. Hmm. So we have our plus inside as a, as a uh, the right of the first plus. Hi. Um, so you can see this can go arbitrarily deep. This is one solution you could, and I, I will, the standard solution is to right nest it, put it in the right side. You can also, if you have really big alternatives, you can balance them and do interesting things there. But this is just the simplest. Uh, and just as an example, here we would have a smart constructor for B3, which says we sort of we inject it into the right side and into the right side again. So we have right composed with right. And for B1, we would say um, left. And for B2, we would say right composed left. OK. So that's, that's sums. That's the, that's the basics. Now we have fields, sort of an orthogonal feature. And if you saw my email, you saw that there's this uh, you know, relationship between sums and parts. So here we've got an example, one alternative, two uh, fields and some char. And again, we have a similarity with a, a standard type, a pair, um, a tuple of two fields. And here I've, I've written this in a prefix notation, but if you've read stuff, you're probably more used to seeing it A comma B. These are exactly equal. It's just a different notation. So again, we can model this field ext2 this, as a type synonym field TX, ext2 prime with a pair with the parameters uh, filled in to the types, and with, well, just one smart constructor. So 
you note that here I'm just using the, uh, the pair constructor here, but I've specialized the types so that this is really only suitable for uh, constructing these, this, um, this model. But the, the implementation of the construction is just standard pair. So this is a binary product type. Uh, and for symmetry and, and, and simplification, I'll use a times or a cross uh, type. And the question again rises, what do we do with more than two fields since this is a binary product? And the answer is the same. We nest, nest to the right. Now, you can see the construction here is the pair in the right, uh, or the second component of another pair. OK. Um, to <laughs> sum it all up, um, this is this construction is called a sums of products, or sum of products, depending on how many sums you have. Um, so recall this example data type D that I gave earlier. And here I've given a identical type um, I call rep D for the data type D. And here I'm using the product that we just uh, discuss and the sum and yeah you can see the fields here the P the P so this is type synonym again uh, but we can have a type synonym that's parameterized uh, just like a data type but just recall that this is uh, an alias a renaming of this type mm -hmm. so what is this uh, U U is basically this unit type uh, renamed. It's a data type with no parameters and one constructor, or one alternative. So uh, you have all one, well we need some way to represent that uh, and so we just fill in this U. So we know it's a, an alternative with no fields. The, just as a side note, the uh, plus and the sum of the product, uh, they are declared as in, this is a right infix, um, so with a, a precedence. So the product has higher precedence than the um, sum, and they're both right associative. So this allows us to write it without having any parentheses, just like you would do in algebra. Um, multiplication is higher precedence than addition. So we saw this red B type. We think we can model these. We have an idea of this is some surprise. But how do we know that we are at, we're giving an accurate model? And this is where isomorphism comes in. An isomorphism um, we define as two total functions that convert between uh, two different types. And total in the sense that all of the patterns are matched. There are no holes anywhere. And these are our functions that define our isomorphism. So we work from the perspective of the data type. So from D, uh, we, have, we match on the two constructors. And we construct a representation uh, just using the, the, the sum and the product and the uh, unit that we uh, just discussed, and then the reverse is what you would expect. So you can see that these are total. Here you're matching all the uh, the uh, alternatives of D. Here you're matching on this type, so you know that from the uh, the the type, the rep, that the left is only going to contain a unit, and the right is only going to contain a product. So this isomorphism, so this, if you were to, to go back and, and if you wanted to uh, go back to your um, days of logic uh, and make discrete mathematics, this is what you would write as a proof that these two are equal. Um, it also is for a practical purpose to allow us to convert between the two, the familiar data type that we write, 
and the structure representation. So the structure representation is this thing that I've been fuzzily uh, uh, describing um, with the representation type. So that's where the rep comes from, the rep D. And um, you don't, so we don't expect, as me coming from a person who's writing a generic programming library, that you want to write the structure representation type, though you could. You probably want to work in your own world of data types. You come up with it for some reason. So we want to be able to convert back and forth, because as we'll see, we can write, we can use the structure representation with generic functions. Oh, one more thing. So, uh, so I gave you sums and products. I mentioned parameters; those come in in the uh, the type itself. Um, but I didn't talk about any of the, the metadata. So we have this D type that's alt one and alt two, but we sort of we lost the alt one and the alt two. Uh, there are cases where you want to have those in generic functions. The one example we're going to show is called show or read. You, you probably know these functions. So we want to keep track of these names. We don't want to lose them. Uh, this is easily uh, handled. We add we we introduce a new type called C for constructor, and it's really you can think of it as a wrapper. So whatever A is stays there, and we pair it with a string, and the string will be the constructor name. So if we rewrite our uh, representation type to wrap each alternative with a C, uh, then we can name these alternatives. And in the, so it doesn't show up in the type because type-wise it doesn't matter too much, at least not at this stage. Um, but it does show up in the values. So here we um, wrap this unit with alt1 and wrap the pair with alt2. So it's a pretty minor change, but it's useful for a lot of generic functions. OK. And there's other metadata that we won't worry about. Like if you have infix operators, you have fixity, or yeah, whatever else these fancy data types will throw at you. So, OK, OK. So we've, we've got all the structure representation. What can we actually do with it? Well, I thought better you get the picture of what it was, and then we'll talk about what we can do with it. So we can use it with generic functions. A generic function is defined on each possible case of the structure representation. So we have introduced sums, products, uh, units, uh, constructors. Uh, you might. You write a function, uh, you could say you pattern match on each alternative, but in that case, it's not generic because it's working on that specific data type. But if we break that data type down into a structure, and you have all of these data types share the same structure, then we can write functions on that structure, then it becomes generic in the data type generic sense that I'm talking about. So a generic function will work for every data type um, that has this isomorphism that we talked about with a structure representation. So as long as you can take your data type to your structure representation, then you can apply a generic function to it, then you can take the result back, perhaps, depends on the type of the generic function, uh, then that's the isomorphism, and then you have uh, very useful generic functions. So the example that I will uh, uh, use to illuminate this is show. Now I wrote it here as a parametric polymorphic function, but yeah, just think of it as something goes to string. So um, what we want to do now is look at how we can take write a generic function show and apply it to each of the possible cases of the structure representation that, uh, that I described. So I'll visit each one and give you what a show would look like for that example. So we'll call this show u, and this is show for the unit uh, case. It's very simple. It doesn't do anything because um, if you think of the example I gave earlier, the D and the alt one, it didn't have any fields. 
So think of this as the fields that follow the construct in A. And since there's nothing there, you show nothing. An empty string. Uh, constructor name, this is where the constructor name is useful. So, to make it simple, and you, it won't be very pretty, when you um, do this, I'll just add parentheses here, print the, add the name. So here I'm saying left bracket uh, appends to uh, the name, which is the string, appends to the empty, so put a space there. And then I have some arguments. So this C, um, remember it, it wraps something. We don't know what that thing is. So in this case, let's add a higher order function to handle that thing for us. And then we can fill it in later uh, when we know what it is. And then we close it off with empty bracket. Um, I don't know how, are you all familiar with the string stuff? This is quite basic, so I just want to make sure. Okay. So that's nothing new. At least that. <laughs> that's maybe the only thing that was new. you. <laughs> okay. Well, ask questions if, if you have that. Okay. Um, so that's construct a name. So, oh, and I just give this a show x to say, well, whatever it is, whatever x is, it'll get filled in later. Uh, that's uh, kind of confusing, but this is actually, now that I look at it, this is actually a different uh, character. So this is the cross and this is the letter x. Uh, <laughs> names like that. Um, so this is the, 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 cro the, the product, and yeah, we do something similar to this. We have the product here. We create, we, we um, use higher order functions for each uh, type. So there's an A, there's an A to string, there's a D, there's a D to string. And then for the product, uh, we just put a space and wrap that with either side of the product. Binary sum. You may start to see the pattern by now. Um, here we have left and right constructors, and we have function arguments for each of those. So when we get to the left, we apply the left one, and the right, we apply the right one, and um, we'll fill in the arguments when we know what they are. So these arguments, these these function arguments. Um, These are going to be specific to the structure of the particular data type. So, for example, the D type, this is what uh, a show rep D would look like. Assuming we have some function that shows integers, which we won't worry about, but it's there. So, this, the D, which maybe I should have put here again, uh, is the alternative uh, with a unit on one side and a product on the other, and then the constructors that wrap each of the alternatives. So now you can see we're filling it in. So the constructor show took uh, some argument, and here in case in this case it's a unit, and the same here, product for the left and the right, and the plus for the left and the right. Oh, and the uh, parameter. Since this is a parameterized um, data type and a parameterized representation, we again have a, an argument here to handle that parameter. Uh, and that shows up here. So when we want to show uh, a rep D, uh, we have to instantiate this uh, parameter with whatever the type is contained in D. Um, now if we want to show a D, it's a hop away. It's a, it's a um, composition with one of the functions from the isomorphism from D. And in this case, this function produces a string, uh, so we don't need to use the other side, the 2D. Uh, so we just need to get from the data type to the representation and apply the um, I won't call this a generic function because it's clearly not generic yet, but apply the show rep D with the same parameter that we get there. Okay. So we're getting there. 
Um, some observations. As I said, this is not a generic function yet, but you can see a pattern, right? You can see this is a very predictable pattern. I could, uh, I could give you any data type, and you could probably write down uh, the uh, show for that data type. So that's good, uh, but it's not quite there. Like another thing is to, to know is that all these functions are named show, show something. Um, so they are kind of recursive in a way, uh, but not in the normal way, right? We can't define, we can't say show with show, 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 or something here, because uh, they all take different types. They're all something to string. But there's the fact that there's something to string, that's, that's, that's useful. Um, another thing to note is that each data type, you know, data types, you have all different structures with these alternatives and fields. You have all different combinations. And thus you can have all, all these different combinations of uh, sums and products. And we want to support all of these uh, generically. So we obviously don't want to write this function for every representation. So to jump into um, sort of true uh, generics or generosity, um, where we can have a structure as a, as, as a parameter instead of a pattern, we need a few more things. We need polymorphic recursion. So recursion, we're all familiar with. Uh, the polymorphic part is where the uh, types can change. So you can call a function uh, recursively, but its type may change. So really you can think about this as functions with a common scheme, uh, but that may differ in a particular place. And you can think of the show functions as each of these, each instance, as different instances of, of the scheme. And the argument position is what changes type. And there's your sort of visualization of this. Uh, if you just put in a bubble there that you've left to be filled in later, you can see that this is the, the scheme. Um, another thing we need is a common encoding for isomorphisms. Uh, common in the sense that works for all data types, or all the ones that we are interested in. Um, this is, the idea is you have a data type T, whatever you want, you define it yourself. Uh, you have a structured representation that you can figure out from that data type T. And then you have an isomorphism from T to its representation and back, the from and the to. So we want to be able to do this for any T, so common to any data type. So first, let's look at polymorphic recursion. Um, there are several ways of doing this. We'll stick with the sort of the simplest with type classes. Uh, if you are familiar with the, the standard type classes like show, eek, um, ord, um, bound, read, these all already use some form of polymorphic recursion because they use the show call. Should we uh, uh, break now? Or? Um, when it's convenient for you, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, go on when, when you see a place and we'll um, mm -hmm. break then. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll do it a few more times, a few more slides and we'll see. Okay. okay. So uh, think of this in a different way. So normally you write a, a function, you have a type signature, you might have type signature, and then you have the implementation. So think of a polymorphic recursive function as a type class defining the uh, uh, type signature, the class declaration is the type signature, and then the instances um, defining each of the recursive cases. So now instead of one function, you have many different functions that all sort of become one be due to the recursion. Um, and as I'll show, I said I'll be sticking with the show. So this is a simplified version of the show class. 
Uh, it has a few more functions, but we don't care about those for now. Um, so let's look at that in the, uh, the instance of show for the structured representation cases. So here we are defining our generic function show. And each of these is a case um, defined as an instance. So the unit, simple enough, um, show equals show u, as we saw before. The constructor case, it wraps something. Uh, so it had this uh, argument uh, that took a had a parameter here. So the argument here now is going to be a polymorphically recursive call to show. So that's why you have this show um, constraint here, because the this this function uh, here was a to stream for some c a, and now we we're, we're calling the uh, um, the class right. So we're calling this now. So this a will later get instantiated to something based on the full type. Binary product is again similar, uh, and here we again put show in each of the uh, each of the arguments to show uh, cross show product, and then binary sum, same sort. So actually, I kind of sneakily showed you the whole generic function earlier, and now I just have to show you the structure to make it generic. Now, recall this. This is what we gave before. And does anybody know the, the, what we can do now with what we've defined? What's the definition of the, the more generic uh, show, if you will, for rep D? Just show? Yeah. Just show. Yeah. So this should be an aha moment. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so now you see that work that we did is taken care of by uh, the type system. So that's the nice thing about type classes is that when you apply this function um, to something, it can rebuild this from this because it knows the structure of the instances and it can resolve the different uh, constraints and it can it basically, it generates it for you. Um, type classes are, are based on a, uh, uh, the idea of dictionaries, where you can look up a function uh, based on its type. So that's what we're doing here. We're looking up the function, uh, the implementation of the function. Based on <laughs> so everybody had their uh, aha moment here already, and you just let it absorb and uh, now we're ready for the difficult relished on it for a bit. So I have my hopes for the beer. Yes. <laughs> Great. So what we got here, we, we got our show, and recall that this was just for the representation type. Uh, this is the, the generic stuff. So to use it with our actual data type, we still need to use that function from our isomorphism to get the representation, and then we can uh, define our show for the type D, for example. Um, so this is still not quite good enough, because we have to write this uh, isomorphism for every, um, every type, and we have to write this function in order to show that type. So um, our next goal is to define one show function that knows how to convert any type T to its representation and given this isomorphism we talked about previously. So this is the encoding isomorphism part. So we define a class of function pairs. Uh, and we'll again use a type class, like we've been using. But this type class has an extra twist, a, a type family. Um, how many people are familiar with type families? Mm. Excellent. Brain frame. <laughs> <laughs> so each function pair 
Influence and isomorphism between data sets and structure of spatial. No more. From, to, and if you look at these, you think, first you must, you must think that you have two types. You have T and a rep T. Unlike show, which had one type. So we said class show A where blah. So this A was this one type that the class is parameterized on, right? So every instance has a different A. Here we have two types. We have T and rep T. Both of these are sort of uh, unknown, right? So, but rep T is determined by T. It is isomorphic to, it is identical to in some way. It is, it is T in another universe. Uh, so we really only need one type. We really only need T because we can figure out rep T from it. And there are two concepts in uh, Haskell that have been floating around for several number of years. Um, so we saw type classes. So there are extensions to type classes, these two. One is a multi-parameter type class uh, with what's called functional dependencies. Mm. And another is uh, type classes um, with type families, or just type families by themselves. Um, these are, I won't go into the to details behind these. You can Google those if you like. Uh, but basically, I just want to say that these are equally expressive for what we want to do. So yeah, it's a matter of taste, which we do. I will uh, describe the type only one um, because it's nicer in a sense. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. OK, so we want to encode an isomorphism. We have a type class. We have a pair of functions. We have the type class parameterized by some type A. And in this type class, as I said, we have two functions. And we have an extra type uh, field, so to speak. So we call this rep. And this, the notation here, type should make you think of what I talked about earlier, the type synonym. So type synonym is a, a new name for an old type. Um, and this type synonym, rep, is, so you, each, you can think of the, you know, each from function to be parameterized by this type A, and then when you give an instance, you instantiate it. So that's the same thing here. So this type, rep, is parameterized by some type A. So as I said, rep is a type family. More precisely, uh, it's an associated type synonym. It's associated with this type class. That's what that means. Um, one, the, the, the way that you should try to think about rep, this type family, is as if it's a function on types. So we have functions on terms. We have from that pattern matches on whatever type A and gives you something of type rep A. Well, rep also, given uh, some unique type, and you, this is often called a type index, you get a type synonym, rep t, wherever that, uh, for whatever t is. So you can think of rep as colon, colon, type to type for all the world of types, if you want. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, for some type t and some type u, uh, rep t and rep u, so these are unique, so t and u are different, they're unique. Um, if they are the same, then, they, then rep, the result would be the same. But even though these are different, u and t, rep t and rep u may not be different. They may be the same type. Um, so in this concrete world of generics, that can mean that two data types may have the same representation. No surprise, right? You can write, um, I gave an either, I defined either and I gave a plus. Those are the same types, or different types, same structure. Okay, so this generic 
uh, type class. So this is the encoding, of, this is the um, signature for encoding isomorphisms. So every instance defines that isomorphism for that type. Right? So for every, you have this world of generic functions, like show, uh, and a bunch of others I will sort of summarize at the end. Um, and you have this world of data types, like D, like whatever, alt x, etc. Uh, for every data type, you need to define an instance of generic with its isomorphism so that it can be used, so that you can use generic functions with it. So for D, this example data type that we have repeated probably too, one too many times, um, we define our instance. And what happens here is, OK, so we have this. This is pretty unsurprising. From is from D to is to D. And this associated type synonym, we've said that for this, this particular rep type, where the parameter or the index is D applied to some parameter, this is equal to or renaming of rep D, P. So this is just a type synonym, but it's a type synonym parameterized by this type. Yeah. Um, so again, I kind of uh, snuck in there and sort of gave you the definition before actually explaining what I was talking about. So we've already seen rep D. We've seen from D. Um, we, can, we know the pattern for these. You know, we can figure it out at least given the data type and some time to read all the documentation. Um, so with another type, we can define a similar instance. In fact, uh, it is so easy to follow this that you can tell the computer to do it. Um, so we can generate uh, rep from and to given the declaration of the type T. And in uh, GHC, sort of the de facto standard of Haskell, we can use template Haskell, which is a metaprogramming uh, language, to automatically uh, sort of generate these, the, the three ingredients. And, or we could use a preprocessor. Not C preprocessor before. But, um, <laughs> so, this is sort of the, uh, gets to one of the beautiful things of generics and Haskell is that the, uh, the regularity of the structure of the data types uh, allows us to generate these ingredients that you need to run functions over that structure. So really, all that stuff about from D and 2D and rep D, you don't need to even be concerned about. Unless, if you want to start writing generic functions yourself, then you need to know the structural ingredients, the sums, the products, and units. Uh, but if you have um, a data type, you don't need to worry about that. And I was talking to Andreas during the break. I mentioned that uh, this is also beautiful because um, you can define your data type, start working with it, or your collection of data types, start working with it, writing code with it, uh, find that you need a show function or a read or some other functions, traversals, queries, folds, catamorphism, anamorphism, all those funny things. Um, and then you can change that data type and still continue to work with all the generic functions because uh, you don't need to redefine them again. So it helps with the, uh, the long term, the maintenance. Um, and it helps if you have really big collections of data types. And finally, we get to the show function. So here I call it gshow just to be different. Um, and now, for any type for which we have a generic instance, that means we have a, an isomorphism. So we have a from. That also means that that type has a representation type, which is the rep e. Excuse me. And if with that rep e, we can use the show function 
now parameterized on that rep, uh, representation of the A time. So this is the generic function that you, in the end, will be using. And that is, does anybody have any questions about this? This is sort of a, maybe an anticlimactic thing. Right there. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, how would you uh, get it to automatically derive the, um, the rep uh, yeah. the, from the two using so the two So in, um, in GHC, so what I, what I described here, is a simplified version of uh, generics that is available in GHC since uh, 7.2. And it has a language extension, uh, which is called derive generics, I think. Uh, so basically, you use that, and in, uh, when you declare your data type, uh, Haskell also has a thing which allows you to derive certain types, like show, read, et cetera. You can say deriving generic, and that's it. And then you got it. And you got it. Yeah. And it comes with a library of generic functions, uh, which you import and use as you normally would any um, function in Haskell. Um, and you can always define your own generic functions. In fact, since this has been in uh, GHC, there have been a number of libraries that have started uh, writing, uh, adding, extending their the, the, a number of library authors have started extending libraries with uh, this generic functionality. Uh, since being in GHC, it's very easy to use, and that's what everybody uses. Um, so, for example, there's a library called Binary, uh, which you can do use serialization, deserialization. They have generic support. There's uh, there are a few others I can't remember the names of. <laughs> so you get serialization for free then, basically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's... And, uh, yeah, when we go but, to the next slide. Uh, wouldn't you then be able to redefine a lot of the, like, prelude stuff, maybe, using the generic stuff? You could. Um, and, and eventually, they might, that might be the case. I think uh, they're treating this sort of as an extension for now because it's not standardized. Um, but there are... <coughs> so there's this core set of classes that's standardized and that every Haskell 98 uh, compatible compiler should derive instances for you. Those are show, read, equality, board, bounded, mm, one more, I can't remember. Um, so you already get deriving from those. And in fact, those are sort of the old style generics because the compiler, uh, in order to get those instances, goes through and parses your uh, the, the Haskell source, the data, your data type declaration, and figures it out for you. So that's sort of the the hardcore because that requires the compiler to have a lot of infrastructure for each one of these uh, classes, and it also made it it was it was like this for a long time where. There were no more deriving classes because there was so much work to implement, and the compiler has to change for every one. So the nice thing about the new generic way is that the compiler just needs to generate a generic instance, and all of these uh, functions can just be in a library. And the compiler needs to be get, doesn't need to be modified as much, and since GHC is sort of a contribution from Microsoft Research, basically, uh, they don't have a lot of time to do all this implementation, and they can, you know maybe eventually shed some of this extra stuff and we can all go into generics. Uh, so it's sort of a, a medium, uh, there's a trade-off between how much work the compiler does and how much work you know, the user has to do or somebody else. Uh, so generics present a nice middle ground. Um, so this is sort of a summary of uh, generic programming and the end of the, the first half, and then we will see if we want to stay the second half. So, data type generic programming, the point I'd like to sort of convey is that the data type, or the data type declaration, is the parameter 
That's the, the generic part. Uh, that's the that's what we're abstracting over. And then instantiating uh, a generic program library um, gives you a large class of generic functions for free, basically. Um, and these functions are they don't give you the parametric polymorphism of Java or the ad hoc polymorphism of template Haskell, but really it's a, it's a structural thing. It's based on the data type itself. So uh, it's, it's a different class from these. And you could actually say it's a subset of ad hoc polymorphism in the sense that you have all these cases, uh, but yeah, it's a bit fuzzy. Um, so I, I presented the show function. Uh, I didn't want to, um, I know there are a lot of other functions I could have, uh, I could give. Uh, I hope this gives you a taste of what it's like. Um, I, these are just some of the other mini generic functions because I wanted to uh, save time at the end for the other thing. So pretty printing and parsing, these are quite standard generic functions. Compression, serialization, decompression, deserialization. Um, these are also very easily done generically. Comparison and quality, you have two data types, you want to check if they're equal or ordered. Um, these are, so the first few are sort of um, take one uh, generic parameter and produce something else, like a string or a bit string or something. Comparison takes two and produces uh, one value. And then folds, unfolds, maps, zippers, zips. Um, you've seen map on this, of course. Uh, you may have seen fold, you've seen fold L, fold R. Um, these are all instances of generic functions on lists. And you can do the, um, the analogous function for all tree-like data types. So these are, uh, these are very dependent on the recursion. So you have the, the, the canonical example um, is like an, an abstract syntax tree for a compiler or a um, interpreter. Uh, a fold is a way to do maybe evaluation or maybe a transformation to uh, another type. An unfold is the reverse to sort of to construct a, uh, a tree. And map is mapping over all of the elements. A zip, you take um, two, uh, a list of, of pairs, and you produce a, a pair of lists, for example. Um, or uh, a zipper is, you heard, are you familiar with the zippers? Anybody not familiar with zippers? OK. Um, so zippers are uh, the way to um, traverse a tree. And you can do this generically with uh, any, anything, even, even with mutually recursive data types. So if you have a family of data types with declarations and expressions and sequences and um, everything, then, then you can write a zipper to find uh, locations in that generically. Um, traversals, updates, and queries. These uh, are sort of grouped together because they're all kind of similar. They will, you can go through a data type uh, maybe um, traverse it in a pre-order or post-order, in-order fashion to produce some, a list or something. Um, you can update it in certain locations, uh, or you can do a query to find out uh, where all the characters are or other things. These are all classes of generic functions. Um, there are Many, many, many different uh, generic programming libraries or libraries that use generics in some way. These are just a few. I presented one that's closely, most closely linked to instant generics. And you know, there's a library on Hackage. Um, generic driving is the one I was talking about in GHC. It's very similar. Uh, it allowed, it adds the ability to do um, generic uh, parameterized data types. So things like a generic fmap. Um, it's similar, uh, a bit more complicated. EMGM, 
Um, extensible modular generation masses. That's uh, one I maintain. And that's a different style, but the ideas are the same. There's one called regular that uses that, that allows you to write folds. Uh, the others don't allow you to write folds. Uh, folds and zips and zippers, those, those class of functions, they're all recursion is sort of the fundamental element there. And in the sums of products uh, view that I gave, we don't really identify where the recursive parts of the type are. Uh, so I didn't even give an example of a recursive type because it's uh, no different from a non-recursive type. Um, if you want to write a fold, you need to know where, rec where the uh, recursive locations are in the type. And that's what regular uses. Multirec is like regular, but for uh, families of beta types. And SYB, Scrapper Boilerplate, is also one that's included with GHC. You've probably heard of it. Uh, that's mainly for traversals, queries, um, transformations. And uh, it's been around for a long time. And then there are more. Um, the next slide is, yes. So that's the sort of the conclusion of this part of the talk.